Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us uh, for this uh, UCLA Health webinar. I'm Dr. William Su, and I'm an assistant clinical professor uh, in the Department of Medicine, and I'm an interventional cardiologist uh, here at UCLA. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about a new uh, procedure called transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Uh, it's a new way to actually treat uh, aortic stenosis. I uh, just wanted to add here that um, you can ask questions on Twitter uh, using hashtag UCLAMDChat. So uh, this is an example of a coronary angiogram. And right here in the middle of the left anterior descending artery, uh, there is a stenosis, uh, a blockage. Uh, and this has been the bread and butter for interventional cardiology for several decades, where we can actually put in a coronary stent and successfully treat the blockage and open up the artery and restore normal blood flow. But what's happening with coronary disease um, is over the last few decades is that the incidence of coronary disease and the incidences of MI, heart attacks, have dropped significantly because of good medical therapy, uh, mainly uh, due to statin medications uh, to prevent heart attack. And that's what this is showing here in that the volume of STEMI ST elevation myocardial infarctions has dropped significantly in the last decade. So uh, interventional cardiologists have become less busy uh, because there's less coronary disease to treat. And that's good because we're doing a good job with medical therapy. So interventional cardiologists have now sought other ways to treat the, uh, treat the heart, uh, especially in structural heart disease. And we have now uh, are able to do transcatheter valve therapies. And today I'm going to focus on uh, valve therapies involving the aortic position and in mainly treating aortic stenosis. And there are two uh, available uh, devices, uh, the FDA approved uh, Edward Sapien valve and then the Medtronic core valve which is awaiting FDA approval. So the aortic valve is normally a tri-leaflet um, valve uh, that sits between the left ventricle and the systemic circulation, the aorta. And uh, this is what a normal aortic valve should look like here on the 3D transesophageal echo. The leaflets should be very thin and highly mobile, allowing for good blood flow out of the heart. But in some people, uh, and especially as people get older, the aortic valve can become diseased and stenosed uh, due to calcification and restriction of the leaflets. And so here on the 3D, now you can see that this valve is not opening uh, very well at all. And because of that, there's pressure buildup in the ventricle uh, causing symptoms. So the uh, way that we diagnose uh, valvular heart disease, the gold standard, is uh, using echocardio um, echocardiograms. And uh, there are certain criteria that we look for on the echocardiogram to determine if the aortic stenosis is severe. So severe aortic stenosis uh, can mean a jet velocity of greater than 4.0 meters per second, a mean gradient, uh, that's the pressure gradient across the aortic valve, the mean gradient of greater than 40 millimeters of mercury, or an aortic valve area valve area of less than 1.0 centimeters squared. So if these things are present, then that qualifies as being severe aortic stenosis by echocardiography. So age-related calcific aortic stenosis is the most common cause of aortic stenosis in adults, and its prevalence steadily increases with age. And it's approximated that about 3% of patients over the age of 75 do have critical aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis starts with progressive calcification initially along the flexion lines at their bases, which then leads to immobilization of one or more of the aortic cusps, and this leads to left ventricular outflow obstruction, a buildup of pressure in the ventricle, and leads to symptoms. So we've said that the main problem with aortic stenosis is the left ventricular outflow obstruction. It causes an increase in the left ventricular systolic pressure. That actually causes increased left ventricular mass, hypertrophy of the heart muscle. That can lead to decreased or um, increased oxygen consumption of, by the heart muscle, and that can lead to myocardial ischemia. And when myocardial ischemia occurs, um, that can lead to chest pain. Um, what also then can happen over time um, is that the left ventricular mass increase can eventually lead to left ventricular dysfunction, and that can lead to left ventricular failure causing heart failure symptoms, uh, and mainly shortness of breath. 
On the opposite side of the valve in the aorta, you can have a decreased aortic pressure, and that can cause lightheadedness, dizziness, or even passing out. So the cardinal symptoms of aortic stenosis are three. Uh, we've got syncope, which is um, passing out, angina, or chest pain, and CHF, congestive heart failure, shortness of breath. So aortic stenosis occurs over a long period of time, and there's a very long latent period when the patient has no symptoms at all. But once a patient starts developing symptoms, and we reach that hinge point there, that's when we know that patient's, um, su patient survival becomes affected. So, and survival depends on the type of symptoms at presentation. So if a patient presents with angina, chest pain, the average survival is five years. If the patient develops syncope or passing out, the average survival drops to three years. And the worst survival is seen in those patients with congestive heart failure, and their average survival is just two years. So um, this is um, data that was taken from the Cleveland Clinic, and they were comparing the five-year survival of symptomatic severe aortic stenosis in inoperable patients and compared them to the five-year survival in, in some cancers. So we're looking at breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, and ovarian cancer. And severe inoperable aortic stenosis has the worst five-year survival when you compare it to uh, these cancers. So it's something that we need to be aware of to treat, uh, to diagnose early and to treat appropriately. So here is a slide from the Mayo Clinic, and this was looking at the natural history of aortic stenosis in the elderly patients. And they estimated that at one year, the average survival is just about 50%. So as patients get older, if they have symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, their survival uh, is um, worse. So here is an algorithm of um, how we treat aortic stenosis. So if by echo, they, uh, a patient has severe aortic stenosis, and if they have symptoms, it is a class one indication to re replace the aortic valve. If the patient has severe aortic stenosis and is undergoing other heart surgery, that's another class one indication to replace the aortic valve. Sometimes patients um, accommodate and adjust their lifestyle uh, because of their symptoms and will tell us in the office that they feel fine. And sometimes we don't believe them. So sometimes we'll do an exercise test to, and get them on the treadmill. And if they develop symptoms or have a drop in blood pressure, that would be another indication for valve replacement surgery. If a patient absolutely has no symptoms and the ejection fraction on the echocardiogram, that's the um, sign of heart function, uh, if the ejection fraction is normal and there are no other high-risk features, then those patients can be followed clinically with serial clinic visits and um, annual echocardiograms to uh, monitor for progression of disease. So the main treatment for aortic stenosis uh, has been aortic valve replacement surgery. And this is open heart surgery uh, to take out the diseased valve and to sew in a new valve. So as I mentioned already, um, according to the AHA and ACC guidelines uh, in 2006, aortic valve replacement is indicated in virtually all symptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis. And we know that aortic valve replacement greatly improves survival. Uh, patients that um, did or did not have symptoms but did get AVR, their survival was much better in, compared to those patients that did not get AVR. So people do live longer uh, with aortic valve replacement. So a very common question that arises, especially since aortic stenosis more commonly occurs in the elderly patients, is that is age a contraindication to surgery? The guidelines specifically state that age is not a contra contraindication for surgery. But the decision to proceed with surgery in elderly patients depends on many factors, including patients' wishes and expectations. So I did my interventional cardiology training at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and we were part of the partner trial. And I actually witnessed a 98-year-old woman get randomized to open heart surgery as part of this trial. And she did very well and was discharged home after just six days in the hospital. So I witnessed this 98-year-old do very well with surgery, and so this proved to me that age is not a contraindication for surgery. But despite these recommendations, aortic valve replacement surgery is underutilized. Um, a significant number of elderly patients do not undergo AVR 
because of comorbidities and the associated increased morbidity and mortality with surgery. And uh, Dr. E. Young uh, reported from the European Heart Study that 33% of elderly patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis were denied surgery by their doctors. And many patients are very fearful. Many elderly patients that are suitable surgical candidates will refuse surgery because they themselves perceive themselves as being too old to survive open AVR. So transcatheter aortic valve replacement has risen as a promising alternative therapy to open AVR in those patients that are either deemed inoperable or high risk for surgery. So the first transcatheter aortic valve replacement implantation uh, was performed uh, via transeptal puncture in France uh, in April of 2002 by Dr. Alan Kabir. And this is a picture of the very first um, uh, aortic valve, uh, percutaneous valve. And uh, a very uh, primitive balloon and system that was, that was used. Currently, we use the Retroflex 3 catheter, and this has a nice tapered nose cone which allows for easier passage across the aortic valve. We have a nice crimped valve onto the balloon, and the Retroflex catheter has a flexing mechanism which allows for easier guidance and passage through the aorta and to properly position the valve in the aortic position. So, um, th as I mentioned in the, uh, earlier in the presentation, there are two valves that are currently being used for this procedure. There is the Edward Sapien valve, which is a balloon expandable valve. It's a stainless steel cage um, that has three pericardial leaflets sewn onto the cage to make a valve. The, uh, another type of valve is the Medtronic core valve. And this is a self-expanding valve. It's made out of nitinol. And it also has three leaflets sewn onto it and um, can be delivered uh, via catheter. And unfortunately, this valve right now is still awaiting FDA approval. Uh, but we anticipate that it will be approved uh, early this year. So, um, I'm going to have an Okay, here we go. So, this is an animation of the procedure. And here we have a bird's eye view of what a stenotic aortic valve would look like. Uh, this is an animation for the transfemoral procedure. So we gain access to the femoral artery uh, with a needle, and we'll get a guide wire to traverse the aorta around the arch and get this wire into the ventricle. And once we have this wire in the ventricle, it serves as a rail then to, be deliver, to deliver our equipment. So the one part of this procedure is to do a balloon aortic valve aplasty. And so here we have a balloon being advanced across the aortic valve. It's going to be inflated to crack this valve open and to allow for more space for the stent valve to come into place. The next part of this animation is to um, advance the delivery sheath. And this is the actual tube that the stent valve is going to be delivered through. And here comes the crimped stent on the Retroflex 3 catheter uh, being advanced and then flexed here in the transverse aorta. And then uh, carefully positioned in the aortic position. The heart is going to be rapidly paced so that the valve doesn't get ejected out with a cardiac uh, contraction. The balloon is going to be inflated and then deflated. And once the balloon is deflated, the valve starts working right away with each cardiac cycle. So here we have um, a valve that was implanted uh, without having to open the chest. The native valve leaflets are being pushed to the side, and it's the calcium within the native valve leaflets that serves as the anchor so that the valve doesn't get embolized out into the aorta. So now you can tell that this valve is allowing for much better flow out of the heart. Here's an actual fluoroscopic example of the procedure. Here we have an aortic injection to make sure that we're 50-50 uh, within the aorta and the ventricle. The balloon is going to be inflated to deploy the stent. The balloon will be deflated. Rapid pacing will stop. And the valve will start functioning right away. Um, we measure the pressures within the ventricle and the aorta, and here is before TAVR. We have the left ventricular pressure and the aortic pressure, and here we have a pressure difference of 112 millimeters of mercury. After TAVR, that pressure difference goes essentially to zero. So the Edward Sapien valve is the first FDA-approved transcatheter heart valve, and it was studied in the landmark partner trial, and I was going to... Um, um, discuss some of the results here of the partner trial since this is what led to the FDA approval of this device. So the partner trial was 
uh, split into two arms. Uh, the first arm that was completed was the cohort B, and these were patients uh, that were deemed inoperable uh, for open heart surgery. These patients were then randomized one to one to either transcatheter aortic valve replacement uh, versus standard therapy. And standard therapy uh, included balloon aortic valvuloplasty in about 83 to 84 percent of the patients. And their primary endpoint was looking at all cause mortality um, over the length of the trial, and they were looking for superiority in all cause mortality. So here is uh, the two year data from the uh, cohort B. Uh, part of the trial, and at 12 months, those patients that were treated with standard therapy, including BAV, had a 50% mortality at one year. Those patients that were treated with the Edward Sapien valve with TAVR had a one-year mortality of 30%. So this was an absolute reduction uh, in mortality of 20%, and this caused a lot of excitement since um, we saw such a huge difference in survival. Um, but you know, all, it seems very attractive that we can be able to deliver this valve without open heart surgery, but there are some downsides. And the downsides are that there is an increased risk of stroke as well as an increased risk of major vascular bleeding. So in, compared to the standard therapy arm, there was a higher incidence of stroke, 6.7% versus 1.7%. And there was also higher vascular complications and bleeding um, seen in the TAVR arm compared to medical therapy. So, that was the um, cohort B. Here's cohort A. Uh, and this part of the trial was looking at patients that were considered high risk. And that was defined as having STS scores. The Society of Thoracic Surgeons have a risk model, the STS score, and looking for patients that had a risk score of 10% or more. And if they qualified, then they were randomized either one to one to either TAVR versus surgical aortic valve replacement. And they were their primary endpoint was looking at all-cause mortality at one year, and they were looking for non-inferiority. So here is the three-year data uh, from the cohort A trial. And basically, this is showing that if the patients had TAVR or aortic valve replacement, the overall mortality was essentially the same. So TAVR was non-inferior to surgical aortic valve replacement. Um, and in terms of stroke in the cohort A arm, uh, there was a numerically higher incidence of stroke, 5.8% versus 3.0%, uh, but this, this did not meet statistical significance. So there is a, a numeric trend to higher stroke in the TAVR arm, um, but it did not meet uh, statistical significance. And we are seeing that stroke rates are coming down even further uh, with the newer devices, uh, lower profile, um, and less um, injury. So here is a picture of Dr. Cribier in France, and this is one of his patients who's over 90 years old, and she had her heart valve over six and a half years ago, and her valve is working great. Uh, her valve area is now 1.7, which is mild aortic stenosis with a mean gradient of 12, and she's living a good life. So what are the characteristics of a TAVR patient? So TAVR patients, um, they'll have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, and they may be old, they may have some frailty, they may have had a history of stroke, uh, reduced ejection fraction cardiomyopathy, they may have a heavily calcified aorta, um, they also may have significant lung disease, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease. All these things um, add up to uh, make patients more uh, at risk for having complications with a s actual surgery. So sometimes we'll consider these patients for TAVR. So as I mentioned before, there is the STS score, and we can actually go online at this website and um, put in patient demographic information such as age, uh, body weight, height, other risk factors, and come out with a score uh, for isolated aortic valve replacement. And in this particular patient, the risk of mortality was 8.3%. And uh, after FDA approval for the Sapien valve, uh, the uh, FDA did drop the STS score requirement to 8% rather than 10% as it was in the trial. So this patient would actually qualify as a high-risk patient for TAVR. So how do we work up a patient for TAVR? Uh, we see our uh, patients in the valve clinic, and the evaluation is done by cardiac surgery as well as cardiology, and we assess the patient for symptoms. We will calculate their STS score, and we also assess for frailty. 
Uh, we want to know if the patient can do their activities of daily living. What is their nutritional status? Uh, how much strength do they have? Uh, has there been any history of falls recently? And it, does the patient have dementia? If these things are present, sometimes a patient is too frail for open heart surgery, and that'll be a reason to consider them for TAVR. Uh, we have to do uh, several imaging tests to make sure that the anatomy is appropriate for TAVR. Uh, we always start off with a transthoracic echo uh, to see what the valve morphology is as well as the hemodynamics. Uh, all the patients will get a cardiac cath uh, to look at the coronary arteries and to make sure there aren't any blockages in the heart arteries that would require uh, stenting prior to a TAVR procedure. We look at the carotids uh, with carotid ultrasound to see if there are any, any blockages in the neck arteries that would predispose a patient to stroke. And uh, finally, we get a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis with contrast uh, to look at the aorta and to see if the aorta is big enough, especially the iliac vessels are big enough uh, for a transfemoral delivery of this device. So there are two uh, valve sizes that are available currently. There's a 23 millimeter valve and a 26 millimeter valve. And depending on what the aortic annulus measures, we'll choose between these two sizes. And um, the best way to um, size the annulus is actually by uh, CT, but we use all the methods to kind of um, collaborate each, corroborate each study. So we'll look at the annulus on transthoracic echo as well as transesophageal echo and also CT. And what we're trying to measure is this green circle. So the red uh, lines represent what the, where the aortic cusps will be, and it's the nadir of all three cusps that forms this virtual ring, the green circle, and that's what we're trying to measure uh, to, for the annulus, and that's how we'll size the valve. And the reason why this is important is that if we undersize a valve, there could be a, a chance for paravalvular leak, regurgitation around the stent. And we know that in patients that have moderate to severe par paravalvular leak, um, their, their mortality is um, definitely impacted. And even patients that even have just mild paravalvular leak, their mortality also is affected. So we want to try to aim for this none or trace aortic valve regurgitation. Um, <clears throat> so using um, echocardiography, uh, we want to try to measure the aortic valve annulus at the hinge points um, and to get a diameter. Uh, but we know that transthoracic echo usually underestimates the aortic annulus by about two millimeters. Uh, transesophageal echo um, can also give a better definition of where, how big the annulus is, and we can uh, use 3D reconstruction on TEE to get diameter measurements as well as area. But we, what we've come to find out is that uh, CT scans are probably the most accurate way of uh, measuring the annulus. And we can do 3D reconstruction of the aortic annulus, get the short axis and long axis diameters as well as the, as the area, and we can compare that to the different sizes of the valves. And we want about a 10% uh, oversizing uh, of the annulus to help minimize paravalvular leak. We also measure the leaflet lengths and the amount of calcif uh, calcification in the leaflets because sometimes uh, these leaflets can be pushed up towards the coronary arteries and we can get left main coronary artery occlusion. And in this particular example, uh, this is what uh, we saw and we needed to protect the left main during the time of the TAVR procedure. So here is um, a fluoroscopy of uh, CINE of uh, the delivery sheath being advanced uh, through the iliac artery and to the aorta. And you can see that this is a pretty big uh, bulky tube that has to go through the aorta. And so we have to make careful measurements also of the aorta iliac vessels as well. So one way that we can assess the aortic iliac vessels is to do angiography. And in this particular uh, case, the um, iliac arteries are big enough for a transfemoral procedure. But we're looking for a minimum lumen diameter of seven millimeters for a 23 valve, and a minimum lumen diameter of eight millimeters for a 26 millimeter valve. So we'll make these measurements on angiography. But CT scan also is very helpful in this regard as well. We can actually make measurements along the iliac as well as the femoral arteries and see also the amount of calcification in the vessels. And so we'll use CT scans to determine whether or not a transfemoral procedure is possible. 
Um, and this is just an example of what our radiology department gives us uh, in terms of all the measurements in cross-section at all the different levels and in the 3D uh, representation of the aorta. So for patients that uh, cannot have transfemoral delivery of the sapien valve, there are other alternative access sites. And one of the most common would be the transapical uh, approach. And this is a procedure in which the surgeon will actually make a small incision on the left side of the chest, expose the left ventricular apex, and will actually deliver the uh, sheath and the valve through the apex of the heart. Another way that we can deliver the valve is the direct aortic approach where the surgeon will make a um, super sternal sternotomy and will gain access to the ascending aorta and deliver uh, the stent valve in that fashion. So I wanted to share a couple of cases. Uh, this is a patient that we treated um, about a year and a half ago. And she's an 82-year-old female uh, who presented in July of 2012 with acute congestive heart failure. And she was known to have severe aortic stenosis by her cardiologist, uh, but was previously completely asymptomatic. And then she presented in July with heart failure, and then her ejection fraction went from normal to now an ejection fraction of 20%. So she was referred by her primary cardiologist for TAVR. So her valve area uh, measured at 0 0.63 centimeters squared. Her maximum velocity across the valve was 4.0 meters per second. So this was, in fact, severe aortic stenosis. Her CT scan uh, showed that her valve a mean diameter was 23 millimeters, and her valve area was 418. And we did not want to have any paravalvular leaks, so we chose the bigger 26 millimeter valve for her. And her iliac arteries were uh, nice and big uh, for transfemoral delivery, so we were able to do this procedure from the groin approach. Uh, we did an aortogram, and uh, this shows that the three um, aortic cusps all in a single plane, so this was a good view. Uh, for us to be able to uh, deliver the valve. But when uh, we got her into uh, the procedure room, uh, we, and after induction of a general anesthesia, uh, we did this transesophageal echo, and it showed that her heart function uh, was not even 20%. And in this particular view, it looks more like 10%. And the ventricle is very dilated. And her uh, left ventricular and diastolic volume was uh, 251 millimeters, milliliters, which is uh, too high. So here is her aortic valve, highly calcified and stenotic with restricted motion, and this is their mitral valve. And when we put color Doppler on her mitral valve, we can see that there's a lot of blood leaking back into the left upper chamber, and so this is severe mitral regurgitation. We also did color Doppler on her aortic valve, and you can see that there's a leak on the aortic valve as well. So she had three major valve pathologies. She had severe aortic stenosis, moderate aortic regurgitation, and severe mitral regurgitation. So, and along with her uh, reduced ejection fraction, uh, it would have been uh, very risky uh, to do this procedure without hemodynamic support. So we ended up doing this procedure on cardiopulmonary bypass. We did not um, stop the heart, but we used cardiopulmonary bypass as a hemodynamic support device. So once we got her on support, here is the echo showing the valve deployment. And you can see the valve coming up nicely here. And then the balloon will be deflated. And this valve is going to start working right away. And this is now the echo after valve deployment. The valve leaflets that were stenosed are pushed away to the side. And now here is the sapien valve with its thin leaflets opening and closing very nicely and with just and no aortic valve regurgitation. But what was interesting on this is that we are capturing some of the color Doppler on the mitral valve. And where there was previously severe mitral regurgitation, there is no longer a leak present. Um, this uh, just to show the aortic valve is opening nicely here with no aortic regurgitation and no uh, paravalvular leak. So we went ahead and also looked at her left ventricular function again. And now this ventricle is much happier. Uh, it's pumping better. The ejection fraction acutely increased to 25%. And the ventricle itself looks less dilated. And we measured that left ventricular end diastolic volume again. It was previously 251 milliliters, and now it's 168 millimeters. So this ventricle 
is less volume overloaded after the TAVR procedure. And now here's um, the color Doppler again on the mitral valve, and the mitral regurgitation essentially went away, which was amazing. So uh, the use of cardiopulmonary bypass in this case for hemodynamic support was essential uh, due to the patient's severe cardiomyopathy as well as her uh, aortic and uh, mitral regurgitation. And in this case, uh, TAVR relieved three separate valvular derangements, the aortic stenosis, which actually um, caused a fixed afterload. Uh, that was relieved with TAVR. The aortic regurgitation, which contributed to her left ventricular volume overload, was also relieved by TAVR. And then her mitral regurgitation, also contributing to her left ventricular volume overload, um, was uh, also fixed uh, with the TAVR procedure. And her left ventricular volume decreased from 251 to 168 acutely. And uh, her mi mitral regurgitation was from fun functional MR from uh, mitral annular dilatation. Uh, which improved dramatically after TAVR. So this is a, a case that we ended up publishing in the Journal of American Card College of Cardiology uh, last year. And so we got some nice um, uh, feedback from that. So um, here's another case. Um, so this is a patient that had Hodgkin's lymphoma at the age of 18 and was treated with radiation. And radiation to the chest can cause calcification over time. And she, this is her aortic annulus, and we got her um, diameters. But you can see that the annulus is very heavily calcified. Her area was 379 millimeters squared, and so that was appropriate for a 23 millimeter valve. So she, there's a lot going on um, in this picture. And she's had a previous mechanical mitral valve. Um, here is the valve going up here. This was a transapical procedure, so the delivery sheath is coming through the apex of the heart. Um, here is a transesophageal echo probe, which is helping guide the procedure. So she, she had a left coronary height that was uh, worrisome for left main occlusion. So we have here um, a guiding catheter sitting in the left coronary artery with a balloon in place just in case we see occlusion of the left main. So this valve goes up nicely here. And we got a very nice result acutely. And this is the aortogram following the procedure. And the valve is sitting nicely, um, and she did very well post-op. And she was discharged home about five days after the procedure. But then a week after, she comes back to the office, and she now has a new murmur. And so we get a CT scan, and this is what we see. So she, here's, her, here's her sapien valve, and here is the interventricular septum, and there is a hole. So this is a, a traumatic ventricular septal defect. There's a hole here um, between the right and left ventricle, and that's what the new murmur was from. And when we go back to her CT scan prior uh, to the procedure, we see that there is this chunk of calcium right at the interventricular septum. So when we put the stent valve in, it pushed this chunk of calcium into the septum and then eventually led to a, a hole. So we brought her back into the cath lab, and we ended up putting in a, a, a plug. So here's a muscular ventricular septal defect occluder um, that's sitting in, in that hole. And we plugged up this hole. And this is a nice uh, 3D volume rendered uh, rendition of uh, what that would look like. So this is the sapien valve. This is the mechanical mitral valve that she had in place. And then we have the VSD occluder that's uh, plugging up that hole. So this was a pretty cool case uh, that we ended up fixing her without having to open her chest. So um, this is a cute picture of a cat and a dog fighting. And this is the battle that's been going on between interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery for the last few decades. And so here, the interventional cardiologist is giving it to the cardiac surgeon. But what this procedure has done is really created a new marriage between our specialties. And we work very closely with the cardiac surgeons. And we now have a heart team. And so this is what we are doing now. We're coexisting nicely. Uh, and everybody's getting along. And these are the members of the UCLA heart valve team. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Tobis, myself, and Dr. Axoy are the interventional cardiologists on the team. Dr. Richard Sheeman and Dr. Murray Kwan are the two cardiac surgeons on the team. Uh, we are supported by cardiac anesthesia, our, uh, our colleagues in cardiac imaging, as well as our nurse practitioners and the cath lab and OR staff. So um, this ends um, the uh, part of the, the webinar, and I just wanted to uh, now go to the audience for questions. And, uh, some of the questions that were asked uh, today uh, via Twitter. Uh, 
the one, first question is, why do you need two interventional cardiologists in the OR if you have two uh, CT surgeons there? So um, this is a team approach. Uh, this procedure uh, does require um, the expertise of both specialties. Um, the cardiac surgeons are very good at opening the, the chest and doing surgery. But this is a procedure um, that also requires the use of fluoroscopy and geography and so, and the um, skills uh, in terms of catheter and wires. So it actually ends up being important that both of us, um, the both specialties are involved in every case. Uh, it, it ends up being um, a good experience for everybody. Um, so the next question is, is TAVR available for patients with other heart issues besides aortic stenosis? Uh, the question is no. Um, so a common question is whether or not this a procedure can treat aortic regurgitation um, because it is still in the same position. But the problem with aortic regurgitation is that there usually isn't enough calcium within the valve that can allow for the device to stick and not embolize. So currently TAVR is only uh, intended for aortic stenosis. Um, the next question is how long does the procedure take? Uh, the procedure itself uh, takes about an hour and a half to two hours. But total time in the room is a bit longer because of setup uh, and recovery. So uh, total time in the room usually is about four hours. Uh, but the actual procedure itself takes about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, the next question is, what will I have to do after the procedure? Um, typically, we uh, have patients stay in the hospital anywhere from three to five days uh, for a transfemoral procedure. For a transapical procedure, transapical procedure, the um, recovery is a little bit longer, uh, five to seven days. And then uh, we oftentimes will have patients uh, go to rehab uh, to get a little bit stronger if necessary. And then uh, also we'll, we'll refer patients to cardiac rehab just to get uh, them back on their feet uh, quicker. Um, next question is how long will I, I have already answered how long will we be in the hospital. So um, next question here is what are the benefits? Uh, well, I showed in one slide that one of the benefits is that this procedure helps people live longer. Uh, mortality is reduced uh, with TAVR uh, because we know that the mortality uh, in patients that are elderly with severe aortic stenosis can be as high as 50% in one year. So uh, patients will live longer and the other thing is that patients will feel better. Because the ventricle, the heart doesn't have to work as hard, uh, patients will feel less short of breath, less chest pain. And, um, and won't pass out. So those are the benefits for doing this procedure. Um, so the next question is, uh, what are some good questions to ask if I am considering TAVR? Um, well, one is you know, to make sure that you're an appropriate patient for TAVR. Right now, this procedure is uh, intended for patients that are either inoperable or high risk. Uh, for those patients that don't meet that criteria, uh, surgery is still um, the gold standard uh, that we uh, treat, uh, how we treat aortic stenosis. So uh, the questions will be whether or not uh, open aortic valve replacement um, still is the best option for you. And then are young children candidates for TAVR? Uh, usually not, uh, and mainly because of the size of the valve. Usually uh, young children have aortic annuluses that are much smaller uh, than an adult, and for that reason TAVR is not intended for uh, young children. Uh, so that are all the questions that we have here. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us to, uh, this morning uh, for this webinar. I thank you for your time, and uh, we're available here uh, to um, see and evaluate you for valve disease if you have it. Thank you. <laughs>